All right. Good morning and uh, good early afternoon for those in the East Coast and good later in the day for anybody joining us uh, from overseas. Thank you for joining us uh, for Format Friday, episode 11, where we have a very special guest, Carl Storms, with us. Hello, Carl. Hello, Tobias. <laughs> Thank you for joining us from uh, hot off of your AU classes and the successes that you had there. Um, wanted to definitely piggyback on the momentum of some of the AU attention that Format was getting. Uh, this year, we had uh, between seven and nine classes. Uh, different people, different customers talking about Formit. Um, so that was really exciting for us as a product team to kind of get to see a bunch of the community around Formit start to grow up um, and start to present their knowledge back to people. So I'm really happy that you're here today to talk about your class. Um, one of the things that jumped out about your class was um, they added a second session. Can you tell me the the story, the backstory behind that? Um so uh, basically what, what happened was you everybody goes through the process of presenting their ideas. Uh, the committee picks them, they get put on, and they decide as they're working their way through how many people may be interested in the class. Um, so you arbitrarily get put into a spot uh, with X number of rooms. Um, throughout the first, I guess, uh, week of my class, it went from a 40-person class to an 80-person class to a 150-person class to eventually went maxed out at the... 285 person class that we ended up with. Wow. Um, at that point, there was still interest. I guess people were were posting on the the AU blog that they were interested in this type of class and would they do a repeat. Um, and then about a month before the class, they contacted me and said, "Would you be willing to do another repeat?" And I said, "Sure." And uh, it took a couple a couple days for the the back end work to happen, but then they put in another class, and it was a uh, I thought it was funny, and I made a joke in the repeat class um, that the repeat was actually two days before the original class. Yeah. So I told them that they weren't the repeat, they were the premiere. Nice. That's yeah. great. Yeah, well, I was amazed that there was that kind of interest and that level of, um, yeah, just people who were interested in learning about the topic of how do I say bye-bye to SketchUp and what is this format thing? So obviously we're, we're hitting some kind of nerve there in the, in the AEC community. Um, so thank you for being able to tell that story. Um, I'll, we'll jump over to you in just a minute. I just wanted to co cover a couple of business items. Uh, so first off, this is the end of 2015, and I just want to say thank you to everybody out there who's listening or watching on YouTube. Um, this has been an unbelievable year of Formant growing up, um, just kind of running down the list of features and um, maturity that the software has gone through since 2015. Uh, last year at AU, we introduced the real-time collaboration feature for the first time. And uh, pretty quickly after that, in February, we introduced groups, being able to group items and uh, then be able to replicate them and uh, have some you know, uh, relationships between those. And then in May, we did the energy analysis feature, the solar analysis feature, and we did uh, the content library as well as the advanced geometry tools like Sweep and Loft. And um, we also added the Formic Converter, which does the SketchUp import, the um, RFA conversions, and uh, does the Revit conversions for you right inside of Revit. And since then, we've also added layers and scenes and the Autodesk material library. And um, last but not least, we also added the Jetpack guy during the year. So. Uh, that's a pretty long list <laughs> of features to just show up in one year of software development. And I, I, we just wouldn't have been able to do it without the feedback of the team um, that's here on this call and uh, the input of people on our forums and on our blogs. So just a big thank you to everybody out there. Um, as with this year comes to a close, it's pretty remarkable how much has happened um, and how much we have in store for you for next year. We are teasing a little bit of stuff out at AU. Uh, I don't want to spoil those surprises now, so I'll, I'll hold off on that. But um, the uh, the future is is bright, and we'll have some new releases um, early in, in 2016 for you to check out. Um, uh, so let me think. The the other couple of business items just in the in the website world. Uh, I've been using Firefox a lot more recently, and I don't know if anybody else has noticed this with Chrome and the web app. 
but it has been really slow to launch. Uh, just to update everybody out there, that is a Chrome bug that they've addressed and they're going to be resolving in their next release of Chrome. So Chrome version 47, it's kind of been a burr in my saddle for a while and yours as well. So I would really recommend using Firefox for much better performance. Uh, okay, so that's that's one thing. Um, the other thing is our, our um, converters. We just updated these last night also. So if you go to the download tab on our website, uh, our, our converters are updated, the 2016 version and the 2015 version. And it's pretty important that you go and get these new versions um, because they uh, will continue to work into the new year. We discovered a, a little bit of code that was in the old versions that would cause them to stop working as soon as January 1st, 2016 came along. So in case you go to use your converter in 2016 and it doesn't run, just go grab the, the latest ones off of our blog and you'll be all set. Um, those are the only kind of updates on our side. I'll go ahead and now pass it back over to Carl to run through his class. And um, just to kind of um, frame this for everybody, uh, we don't have enough time for Carl to run through his whole entire presentation. So what we're gonna do is kind of hit the highlights, have Carl talk about you know doing live demos and the variety of, of um, uh, things that he's encountered with the workflows between SketchUp and Formit and Revit, and also give a quick plug for him doing the full a AU class recap. That will be in January, Carl? Uh, is it early January? What date is that? Yes, it's actually January 12th. Okay, January 12th. Cool. So um, feel free to type in your questions, like always, and I'll kind of field them and answer as I can. And we'll ask Carl um, during little little pauses. And um, with that, we'll go ahead and pass it. To, oh, and the last thing is, as soon as we get the recording converted and ready to go, we'll go ahead and upload that as a blog post. And Carl's been nice enough to share his materials. So we'll also include those. And I'll include a link to this uh, other webinar that he'll be giving in January. So all that will be up on the blog either later today or first thing on Monday. All right, Carl, that's enough um, preamble from me. Take it away, please. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias. Um, so as Tobias was saying, just, just due to the length of time to uh, get through my, my presentation, we don't have enough time to do it today. Um, as Tobias was also mentioning, I did uh, do two sessions of the same uh, class during AU. Um, the uh, repeat class, or as I like to call it, the premier class, which was before, um, I realized that 60 minutes wasn't enough time to get it done. The nice thing about having that premier class was it gave me time to sort of uh, look at and tweak and be able to give a bit of a uh, more fine-tuned session for the large class that Tobias was able to attend uh, at the end of AU, um, which is what I'm looking at here today. The first thing that I kind of want to talk about, and again, the nice thing about uh, AU is that you get sort of almost instantaneous feedback from the people that go to your sessions um, because of the way they have their, their app and their survey set up that as soon as uh, someone fills out a survey and gives a comment or a response, the presenters are able to see that pretty much real time. And one of the things that, that came up quite often uh, was some people were uh, either confused or, or disappointed uh, by the title that I chose. So Revit plus Format equals Bye Bye SketchUp. Uh, I thought it was kind of um, catchy. Uh, however, some people thought that perhaps it was going to be more about taking SketchUp completely out of the workflow uh, for designers, and that wasn't necessarily the intent of the class. Um, the reason that I chose the title uh, Bye Bye SketchUp was in, in a, a past life I worked as a as a BIM support specialist underneath a BIM manager, and we had a very heavy Revit workflow inside of our uh, environment. And what would happen was designers would take SketchUp, uh, and this was before Format was even around, and they would use to do their designs and get things sort of up and running. But the problem was is a lot of times they would take that SketchUp file to a point where they had done too much with it. Essentially, once you get past having it as a standard sort of mass, uh, there's too much information to use inside of Revit. So when it got to production, these people had to go through the process of remaking that content. So that was sort of my intent when I was having this class, was to show people that with Format, we have the ability to create that content initially inside of the Format app, 
and be able to use that content and take it directly through into Revit and continue using that content in a usable fashion. Uh, whereas with the SketchUp workflow, inevitably that model gets taken too far and it brings into rework. It was sort of never meant to be uh, that SketchUp gets completely removed from the workflow. I know a lot of designers really love that tool. It also has the ability to use it in a more of a presentation mode that format, yet uh, doesn't have the ability to do. So that was my purpose. And for those out there that uh, thought it was a misleading title, I apologize. That wasn't the point. But really, the idea was that when we're using format, we want to be able to have that continuous workflow straight through. All right. So as uh, Tobias was saying, we don't really have time to cover the entire class. But what I sort of want to put out there is what my idea was for the class and how it laid out. And as Tobias said, I will be doing a uh, 90 minute webinar which gives me lots of time uh, with Imagine It's online um, BIM group meeting which is January 12th from 1 30 to 3 p.m. Eastern where I'll be able to do the entire session. The way that I laid out the session as this agenda shows was basically I did a quick overview of what Format 360 is and then I went through four stages of, of working with an actual live project. So a client meeting, conceptual design, client presentation, and design development. And basically what I tried to do in that 60 minutes was design a casino and a concert hall from scratch inside a format and bring it inside uh, to Revit and show you how you can do the workflow there. We'll skip over my pretty picture and the free stuff. <laughs> and basically we'll look at what the overview was and this is sort of how I started about what Format 360 is and for all of you that are here on the webinar I'm sure you're familiar so I'll cover this quickly but the idea is that Format is an intuitive web-based apparatus or application if you will that you can use to do your conceptual massing in. As Tobias was saying it runs in Chrome and Firefox I tend to be a Chrome user, even with that little hiccup when you start up, it's just what I naturally go to. We also have the ability to work in Firefox. One thing that I did learn uh, in the middle of my live demo during AU was that while you are using uh, Firefox, you don't have the ability to connect to your local library, um, which was, was a bummer. Mm -hmm. So if you do connect locally to a library, you need to make sure that you're using uh, Chrome to make that work. We also talked about how we can use it on a mobile app, so whether it's Android or iOS. And of course, Tobias was talking about the latest updates to the converter, how we can bring that information directly into Revit. Now, this is one of the parts that I'm going to focus on a little bit more. Uh, that was one of the other questions that I got from my feedback was that uh, there wasn't necessarily enough talk about how that conversion process works. Uh, so I'm going to be brave again, and later on I'm going to do a, a, a live demo where I take a simple project from Formit, uh, into Revit and then show you how we can do the upgrades to that process through a bit of a workaround. Cool. Uh, we also talked about the pro features and again uh, as Tobias was saying they bring these features up uh, very quickly. It's a, it's a very quick turnaround cycle but when I was presenting my project and sending in my submissions to speak at AU a couple things happened. Um, I submitted all of my documents and my, my um, handouts and then the format team introduced a whole bunch of new features uh, like layers and Autodesk material and uh, scenes that wasn't part of my presentation. So I basically had to revamp uh, my entire presentation, but I think it was worth it. Yeah, and this sorry. slide just sort of... Terribly sorry about What's that? that? <laughs> terribly sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> um, and the other thing that I was mentioning is that you can see from this slide, because it's such a quick turnaround, they didn't even have time to update the, the website, which I borrowed uh, this image from, so I added my own little image at the bottom. But basically what we're talking about here are the, the extra features that you get when you, when you pay for, for Format 360. Uh, the free version is great, and it does pretty much anything that you need it to do as far as a conceptual design tool. However, there are a few added bonuses that you get when you take that step to the paid version. Uh, one of them is the collaboration which is sort of always for me far and away the biggest benefit to going to the pro version. And anytime we do a demonstration or show people that feature, it's always a sell. They always love the fact that you can do that. Um, the other ones we had were the Autodesk Material Library, the Solar Analysis, and the Energy Analysis. It's hard to show a collaboration type of environment with a still slide, but I'm going to try. 
<laughs> so basically what we see here <laughs> on the screen is three people involved inside of a project and each person has a little colored ring around their, their name or their avatar and basically what that lets you know is that when you're selecting something you have that person. So orange has an orange color, blue, uh, Carl the consultant has blue and then Andrew the architect has that sort of off green color and so you know when something is selected inside of the model who's actually working with it. We also have the whole energy analysis and this is a really cool feature that allows you to do some quick and rudimentary energy analysis of your project. Again, you need to remember that this isn't, you know, the finalized energy analysis that you're going to do when your project is three quarters done and you're sending your uh, Revit models or whatever you're working in off to your energy consultant. Uh, this is more of a conceptual mass environment where you're doing quick studies on energy of the building as a whole, um, but it's a really great interface. We also enable to do solar analysis, and the other one, the new uh, paid feature is the fact that you can bring in this Autodesk material library, which gives you access to all of the materials that Autodesk has. And the nice thing that I like about it is the fact that you don't have to download them or bring them over from your Revit. They're just available for you inside of the Format Cloud. Any of the ones that you want, you simply click on and bring it into your project. We also talked about the uh, 360 converter and what it allows you to do when you're working with the Formit and Revit workflow. And the biggest thing here is that when you're working with um, Formit, the native file is an AXM file format. And of course in Revit we work with uh, RVT as well as RFA. And what the converter allows us to do is not only convert a Revit family or an RFA file into content that we can bring into Formit, it also allows us to convert a 360 sketch or an AXM file into an RVT. Now, this has always been a workflow that's available as you're saving your content up to the A360 uh, drive where the content gets stored. It automatically converts it to an RVT file. So you have the ability to use that content uh, and download it. It's not instantaneous. It takes some time to do the converting. Um, I find it's a little bit of a quicker workflow to just simply download the AXM file and use this converter to bring it inside the project. And this is the workflow that I'll talk about a little bit later. We also have the ability with this converter to bring in your SketchUp files. And again, this is where the, uh, the designers or the people in your office that use the SketchUp workflow are going to see the benefit of this, is they have the ability to bring a SketchUp file, whether it's a single piece or an entire project, uh, through this conversion app into their format workflow. And depending on how you use it, when you first bring it in, um, some people tend to be a little bit let down because it looks like this sort of big block. Uh, but actually it comes in as groups and as you click through the group that's inside the group, you eventually get to the original piece of geometry which can be edited inside a format. Yeah. Sometimes. I don't want to say always. There's always, there's always going to be cases where it doesn't necessarily work, um, but it does work more often than not. Yeah, I and the just, last one there where we talk. Sorry, go ahead, Tobias. Oh, just that you know, I use that that analogy a lot. The the decoder ring is that a, a SketchUp component equals a format group, which equals a Revit family. So it kind of helps to to kind of structure your mental mindset around that. That making groups and format is like an essential part of the workflow because it allows you to do exactly what you're describing here that you bring it in as a discrete element into Revit, that then you can double click to edit the family and you can categorize that family and do a lot more interesting stuff with it once it's a group and form it um, originally. So just want to enforce that point whenever I talk about it with others. <laughs> yes, and that, that's a very good point to bring out how important the group workflow is when you're working uh, inside of Formit. And, and with all of that being said, the last one that we have there is the reload families, which sort of brings back to that whole uh, philosophy. And what this does is if you have a Revit family, for example, you have a table that you created in Revit and you want to have it inside of your format model, you convert that RFA into 360 content. You use it inside a format. You make changes. You bring the entire format project into Revit to continue down the design process. What you're able to do with this reload families is take that format content, which originally came from Revit family content, and swap it out for the actual Revit family, which basically means instead of it just being sort of um, 
geometry you can't do much with inside a format. It's there to, to be a placeholder, essentially. Once you bring it in back inside of Rev, instead of it just being that placeholder content, once you reload the family, it goes and looks for the actual Revit family, brings it back in and swaps it out. So now you have the intelligence that was originally built into that Revit family inside of this content that you've created inside of Formit. Um, and it really does help with that workflow that you're working with. And of course, the other thing that they added in was the ability to directly access the Format 360 website from your converter. So this is where I started talking about sort of the client meeting and how I was going to go through the process. And again, we don't we don't have the time to go through the meeting, but I thought I would show you sort of how I laid that together, uh, and this will bring me into the sort of the little chat about live demos. So my thought process as AU was inside of uh, Vegas. And we were all staying at the Venetian, which just happened to be a kitty corner view uh, to this little empty lot that they have on the corner of the strip. Um, the bottom one, that Trump Hotel, is actually a picture from one of the rooms that I was in at the Venetian. So you can actually see it from across the road. So my thought, the best way to put together this class was to have a, a, a wealthy client come to me and say they want to buy that little parking lot and they want to make their own casino. So they gave me a location. Uh, they gave me a list of do's and don'ts for what they want to do for this thing, uh, as well as how they want it done and provided a few pictures. So basically, they gave me an address. Uh, they didn't want sort of basic glass towers. Uh, they wanted you know a hotel casino combined. Uh, they wanted something tall, but they have some big buildings in that area that they didn't want to be bigger than, so they gave me some restrictions there. They wanted to add a counter hall as well uh, with a little team. And then they were worried about the shadows. So all of these things were something that we could very quickly put together uh, inside of a format model. So to show you what that looks like, I'm just going to very quickly pop open. A little session here and basically this is how I started off my AU class and what I have here is a site I simply went in I clicked on location I put in the address of the site and we had it in place I already created some uh, buildings for content uh, format is awesome for that once you bring in a site it not only remembers the geodetic location of the site it also brings in the uh, weather information for that site based on, uh, I believe it's the Google Maps that it brings it in from. And that information travels with your format file. And what I mean by that is when you move it from format into Revit, you don't have to reset the location or the weather data. That comes with the format file when you bring it in. So what I was able to do was very quickly put together the context of the, the, uh, on, the wind, sorry, the Encore and the Trump Tower. And I very quickly put together a site location. And the reason why I did that was I can simply click on this, which is just a simple uh, one foot high layout of the building, but it gives me this information right here. And what's important about that information, sorry, my tab's hidden here, uh, is that once I deselect from it and I go back into the project, I can now put in my site area. And as I continue on with the process to make um, my conceptual mass, this comes into play because I can now have my floor areas once I start adding levels and content into my project. So we'll just sort of uh, quickly step through to the next level here. This is the Martha Stewart magic moment. <laughs> That's exactly it. And um, this is one of the things that sort of uh, helped save uh, my presentation was because when we were doing this live, uh, <laughs> we had a bit of a, of a technical glitch um, and my Chrome crashed uh, and I wasn't able to continue on with the model that I had in place. Which is so I had a few feet. Let me just cover that because this is what the class I was there, right, Carl? You invited the yes. entire session of over 200 people to join you in a collaboration session. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and that that was a uh, it was great, and uh, Tobias was even able to put a little tweet out there saying how well it worked before it crashed, yep. which was which was great timing on his part. Um, but that's exactly what I did. When I got to this stage, I started creating 
my little piano-like environment for my concert hall, and I went over to my uh, session and started a share session, which is part of the uh, the pro features. The nice thing about the share session, and I, I like to make sure that people are aware of this, is that only somebody that, that has a pro license can start the share session. However, anyone can join in that share session. Mm -hmm. So if you start the share session, the people that join in don't necessarily have to be a, a pro user. Um, they just need to be aware that they don't get the content when it's done. Um, so I started the share session. I put up the ID to join in uh, with an iPad or whatever device you're using, and as Tobias said, all of a sudden the screen just got crazy with people all joining in and adding content. And that's what I said. It was just that simple. I said, I will do the actual requirements. There's lots of these extra buildings out and about. Um, feel free to join in and add some content to the site. Uh, and boy, did they. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they jumped in and started adding content. And lo and behold, um, it just we had we had a crash. Yeah. I don't think we have any sort of hard limit on how many people can join, but we definitely have seen those sort of things where there's too many people that the system basically just gets overwhelmed. So I don't know if it was Wi-Fi for the conference hall or if it was people undoing their other people's changes in real time, but it definitely overwhelmed the system. So uh, just as far as best practices go, probably three to five people in a collaboration session is is ideal. <laughs> And, and that's good good to know, Tobias. And uh, however, there, there was before before it did, we did have quite a few people. And in my earlier session, uh, the one I did on the Tuesday, the premiere session, if you will, we had about ten people in in the model working away at it, um, and we didn't have any issues. Nice. Now, with that being said, it was probably only about a ten minute portion of the presentation, um, but we were able to get by. Good. And what you mentioned, which is something else that is good to bring out about these uh, collaboration sessions is there are no restrictions. And what I mean by that is when you're working in a work shared environment inside of Revit, there's work sets and you know only one person can own one piece of geometry. Inside of a format, when you're getting that shared environment, you're all working real time inside that same model, which means everybody can touch anything. Yep. Which always likes me to make sure that I tell people the undo story, um, which is that if you grab a piece of geometry and then you sort of uh, look at your phone or take an email or do something else, it's been, it's been a while, and you go back, oh, I didn't want to do that, I go to undo. It's not your undo, it's the undo of the entire model that you're working in. Right. So you just want to be aware of that, that if you, if you undo, it may not be what you think it is, it may be something much bigger, um, yeah. which, which is just good to be aware of. Totally. Yep, it's a, per, it's a per model undo, not a per user undo. Correct. Um, so just sort of to carry on, so I was able to go ahead during the session to put my content in place. I get everything sort of up and, and down and where we want it to go. And then I decide to, to move on to show it to the client. Now one of the nice things about the new features that uh, Formic came out, um, and by no means do I hold any grudge that they made me redo my handout um, after I had submitted it to add them in. I have no grudge about that at all. That's okay, Tobias. Okay. <laughs> um, but the benefit that they brought in that I liked was the fact that they brought in uh, layers and the ability to have scenes. And basically what this adds to your workflow is the ability to have some um, visual control. Now, I don't want you to think of them as having layers as in AutoCAD, they're more as in layers in, in Photoshop where you have the ability to turn things on, turn things off, and control what stuff looks like. And just as a quick example, uh, I open my layer tab and you'll see I've got what is it, eight or nine different uh, layers active in this project. And if for whatever reason I don't want to see my Trump Tower here, I can just simply turn off that layer and the information goes away. Same thing if I zoom out and I don't want to see the concert hall, again, for whatever reason, uh, I can just turn it off and it goes away. And I have the ability to continue working on my project if I want to do a solar study or a shadow of just one building or one part, I have the ability to do this. And it's really simple to add another one. You just simply select the add layer, I give it a name, and then when you select something that you want to add something or create something, you just simply create an object. It's going to be so tiny. 
It is. It, that's, that was the other thing about this particular demo was that the, uh, the scale of it was much bigger than, than sort of normal. Um, oh, I didn't really take that into account when I was creating it, the fact that I had uh, several large uh, casino towers inside one project. Totally. Um, but as you, as you see here, I selected the object. Under properties, I can simply just put it on a layer, and it's now part of that layer. Yeah. And if we go back to our layers, I can turn it off. Nice. So, so that was a, a neat new feature, and it, it gave us the ability to put things together to present to our client what we want. And what came in hand in hand with that, that took it even to that next step, was the ability to have these scenes. So what scenes allow you to do, and I'm just going to turn these layers back on. And so what these scenes allow you to do is to take the content that you've created and basically navigate around to get the best view of what you want to see, and then you can create a scene. So I add a scene, give it a name, I'm going to be boring and just call it one, and I now have that scene inside my model. Now I can navigate around, oops, I'm now behind my building, <laughs> and zoom back in and add another scene. And I can keep going until I get sort of all the locations that I want, again with my very unoriginal names. And so each time that I clicked OK and saved the scene, it sort of saved that viewpoint, if you will. And we have the ability to say, play scenes, and it goes through, do you know if it's what the time is, Tobias, for between each scene? Yeah, we have it set for two seconds per scene right now. Two seconds. Okay. And basically, as you see, it scrolls through those scenes, and it'll continue doing it until I say stop scene. Now, that's pretty cool. It allows you to do a bit of a sort of slideshow, if you will. But what's even cooler is that you can now start changing the, the visibility of that scene. And so if I were to take, uh, I'm currently on scene four, and I hit the little slide, you'll see that there are four things that are controlled within that scene. So the camera position, the layers, uh, the suns and shadows and visual styles. So that means I can control these things and they would be different if I save. I can also unclick any one of those boxes. So if I didn't want layers to be part of this scene, it doesn't mean the layers aren't visible. It just means that if I make changes to the layers, they're not saved within that scene. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of just to show this, I'm going to turn off my uh, towers that aren't part of my content. And then I'm going to change some visual settings. Ooh, careful with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I forgot about my pretty face. Uh, so I, I add on the scenes. And then the key, the important thing here, is that we have to now use the little recycle symbol here to update the scene. So even though I made these changes, I haven't told the scene to remember these changes. So I select that. I go back to scene three, and you'll see that all that content is there. I go back to scene four, and live demo does me a, a disservice. Let me turn off, try that one more time. Oops, wrong one. Yeah. And then change my settings. There we go. There go. Um, so now, as, as you see, it was able to extend and change that scene. So it really is a cool way to, to change the visibility for one view to another. Um, as Tobias does, all, as I've seen him do his demos, have almost like a design option type of feel to your drawing where you can have different views and different looks uh, inside your thing. Unfortunately, at this time, you'll notice that we don't have the ability to control material. Um, maybe that's something you can add to the wish list. Yeah, that came up a couple of uh, the last one of Friday when we were talking about design options. People wanted to say, oh, yeah, can I toggle that? And it, you kind of can. It's just more, the, the material is more a property of the geometry. So 
like if you were to copy your top tower and then paste it in place so you have two different versions you could have one version with one material and then the second version with the other material and toggle those on and off with layers so you know that's going to be a tougher one for us to to work at that way but um, at least you can get it done right now just by copying geometry well, and, and, and that works. That's that's actually not a, not a horrible uh, workflow. Um, so you, you heard it here first. There is always those those workarounds that you can do to uh, to get your information in there and out there, yeah. which is a perfect segue um, to the next part of of my content. Was once I got this ready for the client, I went through and did a client presentation, which led to this slide which is the, the client said, okay, uh, the little building in the corner which he had planned to purchase uh, and bulldoze to make his grand casino, uh, he wasn't able to do. So we needed to adjust our casino to allow for that. Uh, we wanted to add a little bit of outdoor space on the roof and as well as add some balconies uh, to our site. So I then went back into my content and made some quick changes. I didn't save that one obviously, but where I just went in and made some changes and adjusted this so that building was available. So again, I can very quickly do it here. Uh, and one thing that I'm sort of skipped over here, but again, is very important, is the fact that all these different elements were put into individual groups. Uh, one, it does the ability of not having my casino automatically linked to my um, hotel tower so that I can have them changed and manipulated separately. It also, as Tobias says, allows us that when we bring that information into the Revit flow, we have the ability to control it as a group. And you'll see here, because this is a group and I'm editing it, not only can I give it a name, but and this is important, I have the ability to assign it a category inside of Revit. So now when it comes inside of Revit, it's not just dumb geometry. It now has the ability to be controlled by a category inside of Revit. Yeah. It's not all categories. It's just the categories you see here, and generally they're the ones that are, are standalone categories. But that's a big step to be able to have that geometry and be able to control it uh, as such by the category and also be able to swap it out for other uh, family elements inside that same category. Yeah. And let me give a quick shout out to Brian Mackey, who I believe is on the, on the webinar here. He and I disagreed about whether you could do a wall by face and curtain system by face on generic models. But I discovered that he was correct. You can do wall by face onto a generic model category. So we default that all the geometry is a, is a mass. <clears throat> but if you switch to a generic category, um, that element will come in as like real geometry, real stuff instead of that um, weird mass geometry. Uh, and you can still apply wall by face to it. So uh, Brian, you were correct, sir. Hey, that's good news. Yeah. Um, and, and that was a great sort of voiceover as I was updating my geometry so that I allowed <laughs> it to, to meet the criteria of, of what the, uh, the owner had wanted. And just to point out over here, we talked earlier about the reason why I brought in that quick outline to very rudimentary find out the area of the site is once you have a layers inside of your model, you now start getting information like this, your floor area ratio, that as you start moving your content, it's going to tell you how much of that site you're covering. And it's a little handy little tool that's very easy to get access to. And of course, the last thing, because we all know that they're going to want to make sure they maximize that site, I'm just going to edit this last little one again and draw in some extra area here. And I love the fact that we have these dimensions that pop up that you can simply just double click on to make your, your sizing more exact. Or as I like to do, hit the tab button and the little button shows up so I can make that exactly 455. Now I can click on this and pull it up and I simply hover over this existing edge and it matches up. It knows it's the same size. It blends together. It becomes part of that building. I just finish. And I very quickly have recreated that object and melted it into one. So when you're working with groups, that's one of the things that's handy to know is 
when you group and don't group. Uh, because I have the tower and the casino as separate groups, I can add to them without them melding into one. Because I added that front piece to the casino without grouping it as individual, it automatically blended itself or melted itself to be part of that object. So once I had this all finished, I saved it out, I brought it into um, Revit and was able to show the difference between the original piece and the other piece. Because it's such a large model, it really took a long time to do that. However, because I'm such a brave guy, I'm going to try to show you that process of bringing the information into Revit, converting it, and updating it real time now with a slightly smaller model. Uh, and while I'm going through this process, uh, I would like to do my shout out, shout out as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to Jarrett Schultz, who um, at least this is where I learned about this particular process during his class at uh, RTC uh, in Washington. And then he also did a format Friday where he talked about um, doing this session. You can see that he has access here on his website. It's also on the format uh, blog where you can click the link and download his little PDF on the information on how to do this. So um, he was gracious enough to sort of present this workflow and then share it around and that's where I came upon it and it really is uh, um, well not perfect it is a workflow that works that allows you to get through the process of taking something you've created inside of format bringing it into Revit starting your, your documentation process and being able to capture those changes as they happen inside of format okay. so I'm starting to get long here so I'll just very quickly show you this is a content that I've already made up just a simple building with some context, uh, somebody wants to add some change to this building. I've got the building in place, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my export. Export locally is a Format 360 sketch. Hit that button, and it downloads it very quickly as an AXM. Yeah, and somebody was asking so about shift. file size. Can you can you check to see how big that AXM file is? That one's going to be tiny because it's there's not even materials on it, but. Probably. Yeah, it's only 11, <laughs> okay. 11 kilobytes. Real tiny. Yes. Um, so then I'm going to create a brand new project. And this is cool to point out too. If you have a, a default template for your office, you can specify that here. Um, so you don't have to use the out-of-the-box Revit template or the one that we supply in the converter. You can um, choose your own. Yes, and that's a good thing, and, and uh, a couple times this has come from different sort of format Fridays, that as you sort of get used to the process that you can start creating a template that's going to have your masses on and mm -hmm. things like that, so when you convert the object and bring it in, you can see it right away. Yeah. So I'm just going to very quickly save this. And set up the default material for mass however you want, so it doesn't have to be that kind of weird transparent purple thing if you don't want. That's right, although I kind of like that weird transparent <laughs> purple, so we're going to go with that. <clears throat> so I've got a brand new project. There's absolutely nothing in it. I go to my add-ins, go to my format uh, converter. This isn't the brand new one yet. Uh, and I just say convert format sketch to RVT. So I select that. I navigate to the file and hit OK. And again, this is 100% real time. There's no Martha Stewart magic here. Um, so I zoom out. You'll see that I have my, my content. I go to my 3D view. Add in some some color. There's our nice purple purple uh, mass layers. Yep. And all I'm going to do is just tap through and select. Oops. Go to my mass and settings. I'm going to add some walls. Make them uh, brick so that I can see them. So very quickly, add some walls. I'm also going to add a roof. Go to my visibility graphics. Turn off math. And we see that I've got something that I can start working on. I go back to my floor plan. Again, zoom out. Turn off my math again. And you can see I can now actually start working on real Revit content. Now, that's straightforward enough. 
where the, the workaround bit comes in is that when you get to this stage and you need to make a change, you have people working in a Revit workflow, you have people working in a format workflow, uh, the people working in format go to the client, show them their, their very quick and easy to manipulate model and there's some changes. So I go back to format. The client wants to make it a little bit taller. and a little bit longer. And again, this is a, a very um, simple workflow, but the idea is that to be able to show it real time and to go in. So I've made some changes. I finish up my group. Uh, you can save it at this point. Um, you also don't have to. The, the model has changed so that when I export this, even though I didn't physically hit save, it's going to export whatever's on the screen. So again, I bring through and I save it out as format Friday 11 in brackets 1. Now this is where the workaround part works. The, the format converter at this time doesn't allow you to just reconvert that and automatically update what's inside the file. So this is the workaround that Jarrett came with. So what I do is I start a new project. And this is where having one of those templates saves you a little bit of time. So I start a new project and I go through the same process of bringing in the content. But now I'm going to make sure it's the new one. And it brings it in. And if I go to 3D, it's a little bit bigger. You can see by the floors that it's, it's, it's a bigger site. <clears throat> so if I, what I need to make sure happens here, and this is that little bit of tricky part as you're working your way through, is I tab through and make sure that I select the group that it comes in as. And you'll see that it is group, work, type 2. And you'll see it's family 10 and R2. If I go back to the other project, and I'm going to turn back on my masses, and I very quickly tab through and select just my mass. I see that it is family type 2, but also family 8. So you need to do two things. One, make sure that you're on the proper um, group, family, when it comes in so that it has to be exactly the same name. So I've got family 8, family type 2. Um, what I'm going to do just to hedge my bets, is I'm going to select this guy, and I'm just going to go down to my families, masses, and I'm just going to rename this one the same, just to cover my bets. It's actually the uh, family type 2 that I'm using, but I just like to make sure that everything's exactly the same because it makes the process a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is is because the way we bring this into our actual model is we select the family, we say edit family. Now we're in the family editor context, and what we can do is with the load in project tab, choose our active project. Say OK, and we had an issue. Yeah, so this is one that <laughs> happens all the time, and it's if you're doing the conversion in the same session like we always do with demos, then it's not going to do it right the first time. So just pop back to the um, family, and then you can um, do it again, and it'll work the second time. So fine. Really? So mm -hmm. if I go back to this guy, no. What also I find happens sometimes is the naming. You have to make sure you're using the exact same uh, family. So say, for example, if I change this to family 8 and then go back into my project. You know, this is a good point. Um, you don't actually have to have the same name either. If you just load that mass into the family, then you should be able to select it and just use the type selector to swap it out too. Yes, in theory. Uh, however, <laughs> when you don't get the dialog, when you don't get the dialog box that pops up that says do you want to override this, it doesn't allow you to change the Revit elements. 
So if I just swap out the family, the the walls that are assigned to that original mask don't transfer over to the family you swap out to. Okay. So I can't update them. So that's where the where the issue comes in. Where is it? There we go. Well, all is good with, with, with good intentions. <laughs> and I, I, I literally just did this a second ago, and it worked. Hmm. Um, oh, well. The, the, the point being, or supposed to be, is the fact that when you bring that information in, you have the ability to take this actual content that's associated with that family and update it as you bring it in. Hmm. Uh, so that when you select it, you have the ability to update the face and the information comes through with it. And... Um, this is why there was all that talk about live demos, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. They, they seem to be um, the bane of my existence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely um, mean what, uh, you've, um, what you're trying to show, and it does work for just updating one smaller piece of your, of your whole model. So uh, I'm not sure what we're doing wrong today, but it, it's, a good, it's a good workflow. And just to tease a little it, bit it of, is, a, of a future enhancement, we're going to... Um, add export visible and export selected so that you don't need to um, uh, update your entire format file or, up, or redo an entire Revit file. You can just do one smaller piece, not the whole entire thing. Um, that was a pretty big request right after we came out with layers that you can just export one layer that's visible or and something like that. Oh, hey, there you go. All, all it took was to bias the talk and then it worked. <laughs> and I think what I've, you had mentioned that you had to do it twice. I didn't close that original edit family. Uh, and so just to continue, I select the wall, update the face. Sometimes you get a little bit of a warning here, but then it works. Nice. Again, I can select the roof, update the face, and now we can continue on with that process and we've now updated our actual Revit content to the updated format uh, shape and we can continue on with our process. Cool. So nicely rounds and brings that back. Um, I know we're getting long here, so I, I will end my little bit there. And if anybody had any questions, um, I'd be glad to spend eight minutes trying to help them out. <laughs> yeah, perfect. There's been a handful of questions coming in um, as you've been talking. Uh, one question was about the cost of Format Pro. And right now it's a subscription. So it's I, in the range of $30 to $35 if you buy it per month. Um, but if you buy a year subscription to Format Pro, it's $300 right in that range. So very affordable to add on to your um, your Revit piece and also very affordable when you compare it to uh, a SketchUp Pro license, something like that. Um, if anybody, sorry, if anybody had any questions about uh, sort of SketchUp questions too and, and being able to put SketchUp away, let me know. Um, Omar has been asking a ton of questions and one of his comments was, oh, I really can say bye-bye to SketchUp. And that was right about the time you were showing layers and scenes working. So <laughs> that, was, that was part of our Good. thing too when we developed those features is uh, these were our number one requests coming from people wanting to move away from SketchUp and, and you know, kind of introducing format to their, their offices and saying that was their first question was, uh, can I turn things on and off with layers? And can I save my camera viewpoint with those layers turned on and off? So the answer is yes, now you can do that. So hopefully that helps. Um, looks like we do have a question from uh, Joseph, so let me ask that too. Can we bring the format model AXM directly to InfraWorks for the urban scale planning with 3D context? And this is cool. I've been answering a couple questions about uh, site and topography uh, because I've been playing around with um, InfraWorks this past week. So just a quick um, update for, for people on that workflow. It is cool. InfraWorks is an awesome software. I don't think it's a cheap software. I think it's like in the $8,000 range. But if your firm already has it or if you just download a trial, you can check this out. Uh, you can um, set your site in InfraWorks and you can export that site into OBJ format um, and also FBX. So in the future, we'll probably support FBX. But for right now, OBJ will work. And you can export it a certain way that will let you do the buildings and the site as separate files. So I'd really recommend that because you can then place your buildings into your site. 
uh, and you don't have to model the context or kind of guess at the context. It's already built for you. And then you can also import the sites, and that'll come with curbs and topography. So we get that question about topography a lot. Um, that That's a, a bigger file, so it kind of depends on how big your site is you're making in, in InfraWorks. But assuming it's not too large, you can bring in the site and curbs and buildings from InfraWorks to set up your format file. So that's step one. And then you kind of enhance your format file with your design, your model. And then you can export that then either as an OBJ file or as an FBX file in the future. And you'll be able to plop that right back into uh, InfraWorks. And also I left out the biggest one. You can import an RVT file into InfraWorks. So uh, that would make the urban scale and also you know, some of the walking a client through things. Maybe they want to see it with a lot of more um, realistic looking um, context of the urban scale. So anyway, messing around with InfraWorks, it's a pretty powerful workflow to, to plug in your format piece.